Welcome to Untold Stories of Innovation, where we amplify untold stories of insight, impact, and innovation. Powered by Untold Content, I'm your host, Katie Trout Taylor. I'm thrilled this morning to have as our guest Paul Andrew Smith. He is a best-selling author. He's published several books on the art of storytelling in business, lead with a story, sell with a story, and parenting with a story, as well as the 10 stories great leaders tell. Paul has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, Time Magazine, Forbes, Fast Company, Washington Post, you name it. He is a former P&G exec, and now he travels the globe as a speaker and a trainer with companies like Google, HP, Bayer, Walmart, Kaiser Permanente, Ford, Luxottica, um, and dozens of others. Paul, I'm so thrilled to have you on the podcast to talk more about how storytelling can play a role in the process of innovation. Welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's good to be here. Wonderful. So I love to start each interview asking, what role does storytelling play in the innovation process? Ah, Yeah, good question. Okay, so probably several. Um, The ones that come to mind, first of all, is as a uh, creativity booster, like listening to other people's innovation stories literally, I think, makes you more innovative. Right, just hearing that somebody else did something um, in a different industry, com- a completely different industry, that was outside the box, done very, you know, breaking the rules, not only gives you license to do it, but it, I think it literally gives you ideas for what can be done in your industry. So, for example, um, w- w- one of the one of my favorite examples of this that I heard myself while speaking at a conference, uh, a conference for. Um, consumer researchers, by the way, and that, that's relevant. So during one of the breaks, somebody told me that they worked at a, um, a company that makes air conditioners. So window unit air conditioners, all right? I worked at the time at Procter & Gamble. So you, we didn't make window unit air conditioners. You know, we, we made, you know, shampoo and soap and <laughs> coffee, right? Sure. Um, but what they told me was one of their interesting research challenges at one point was uh, they wanted to develop an air conditioner that was super quiet, right? Because little loud air conditioners are kind of an annoyance, right? So uh, the job of the researcher, though, the consumer researcher, was to figure out how much more would people pay for a super quiet air conditioner. The problem was their company hadn't invented it yet, right? They, they just wanted to know how much more pe- would people pay because if it was a lot, they'd, they'd probably be willing to invest more money to invent such a thing, Right. So here this researcher had this challenge, how do I do research and ask people, find out how much more money they'd pay for a quieter air conditioner? Because they can't just ask in a survey, well, how much more would you pay for an air (laughs) conditioner that was 15 decibels quieter? Like nobody knows what that means. Yeah. How do you even measure decibels? It's really about quality of life questions. Yeah. Right, right, right. So they, but they came up with a really creative, innovative and super cheap way to test that. He said, what they did was they, they took their regular air conditioners they opened up the front of it and they took all the guts out of it and then they put the front back on and then they cut a four inch hole in the back of it and they uh, they attached a tube, uh, a hose to the back of that air conditioner and they installed that fake empty <sighs> air conditioner in the window of one of their test houses, right? And then they uh, the tube ran down the hallway to the room next door or, or two or three doors down the hallway where it was attached to the front of a regular air conditioner, you know, the, the, the loud kind that works. <laughs> and then they marched a bunch of consumers through the test room and uh-huh. had them, we'll say, go turn on the air conditioner. And they would go turn the air conditioner on. And of course, nothing happened. But at that exact moment, somebody who was watching through the video camera turned the real air conditioner on two doors down so that magically almost this crisp, clean air started flowing out of the front of this air conditioner, but without making really much of a sound right? And they could vary the loudness of the sound by how close or far away they put the real air conditioner down the hallway from the fake air conditioner. And so this was a way to test how loud, uh, how much you know more would people be willing to pay depending on how loud the air conditioner was without actually inventing the quiet air conditioner first. Now, I, and I just, I just thought, gosh, it, you know, at P&G, we would have never done that. We would have 
we would have invented it first. We would have spent years and months and millions of dollars trying to create, or we would have created an elaborate system of speakers and, you know, to, to recreate this situation. Whereas, gosh, oh my God, it was so simple. <laughs> just, just, you know, empty it out and connect it to a real one down the hallway. So that kind of thinking just makes you realize, oh, I could probably apply that same kind of really outside the box thinking to my industry, even if I don't work in that. So stories like that, I think, serve a role in spurring creativity. Absolutely. You think about, well, I, the, the methodologies that, that come to mind with, through that story relate back to the lean innovation process, getting a minimum viable product. How much can you learn? How fast can you do it? How cheaply can you learn in order to get the core insight you need to make a smarter, scalable uh, solution? So, so that's the story you know, you and I both sort of analyze story patterns. Mm-hmm. I I love your books. I've read them. Um, I, I follow your work. And something that I really appreciate about how your mind works is that you break stories down into their functions mm-hmm. and into their structures so that they're repeatable by others. Right. And that particular one, I'm thinking of how that's a, a stories that are shared like that actually become lessons mm-hmm. that create a culture. You know, it, if I hear a story like that and it's day one for me in an innovation team and I hear that from my innovation leader, I know that it's okay to be agile, to mm-hmm. rapidly test. I know that prototypes and MVPs are going to be valued more than year-long high-budget experiments. And I'm probably going to feel a little more comfortable failing mm-hmm. um, and being able to fail on a smaller scale in order to get to the conclusion or the, that key insight you need to right. get to faster. Yeah. Yeah. So I, that's, so that's one use I think of storytelling is to spur people to think of different ways to accomplish something in a creative way. Um, back to your original question. I, I think another purpose and use of storytelling in the innovation process is to help people recognize uh, when there's a need that needs to be filled. Cause often you, you, you know, necessity is the mother of invention, right? Well, you need to recognize the necessity. And so, for, for example, one of the, the, the story that kind of taught me this lesson um, happened at Armstrong International, which is this multinational conglomerate. They, they make all kinds of machines and things. And um, uh, one of their salespeople went uh, to visit one of his customers for the first day. It was a new, a new job for him. And so he wanted to go visit them at their manufacturing plant where they were going to use the big valves that this Armstrong International made. And so they took him on a plant tour. So he's out there walking around the plant with, you know, being escorted by their executives or whatever. And he saw this um, forklift uh, lift a big, huge wooden crate way up into the air as they're walking by and it gets higher and higher and higher. And all of a sudden this big crate tips over and falls off of the forklift down, you know, eight, nine, 10 feet, you know, onto the concrete floor, not too far from them and shatters oh like into goodness. dozens of pieces and the, 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 whatever was in it goes spilling out all over, all over the floor. Um, of course he, he is the one that sees it happen. He yells, look out, you know, and he ducks and he grabs somebody and pushes them aside. And My like, goodness. you know, he thinks he's a hero and he saved everybody. And sure. And they just start laughing at him. He's like, <laughs> what? And they're like, that, <laughs> sorry, that wasn't an accident. <laughs> I, we did that on purpose, but it wasn't like a show for him or anything. He he, yeah. he said, why, why would you drop that crate from so high and break it like that? And, he, and uh, the forklift driver came over and explained. He said, well, that crate uh, comes from one of our suppliers and they make this product that we need, but the crate is so well built and nailed and screwed together so tightly and the wood is really strong that it is just too hard to get open. I mean, you know, it's like the packages that you and I buy at the store with all the plastic and you need the jaws of life to get it open. Well, it's kind of similar on a larger scale for them. So it's just hard to get this thing open. And the thing that we buy that's inside that crate is indestructible. So we just find that it's easier to open the crate just to drop it and and just let the crate break. And then the parts we need are just scattered over the floor and we just pick them up. (laughs) And, (laughs) And so he, and that just fascinated him. And he walked over and picked up one of the pieces of wood from the shattered piece of crate and right there written on it, was his company's name, Armstrong International. That crate came from his company. And that's how he learned that, oh, we're making our crates too strong. (laughs) So much so that our customers are creating a safety hazard 
because yeah. it's too hard to open up the package that we send our product in. That's right. Like nobody knew that until that moment. And so now they ship their product just on these little uh, skids without, you know, the, all this fortress of, you know, wood around it right. because it's obviously creating a problem. Not nobody complained about it, um, didn't show up on their surveys. But it happened because he watched and noticed. So, so the, the the purpose of that story is it teaches you the value of compensating behaviors, all right? So uh, a compensating behavior means a behavior that your customer goes through because there's something wrong with your product, right? So b- because there was something wrong with his package, they changed their behavior. Instead of opening it with a crowbar, like most people, they dropped it from the sky, <laughs> right? right? That tells you there, if, if, if a customer is using your product in a way it was not designed to be used, that's telling you something. It's telling you you've done something wrong, right? So you, you don't need to look for people dropping your packages from the sky. I mean, that of course would tell you one thing, but the point is hearing that story, you can realize, oh, I need to consciously go out and look for my customers using my product in a way it was never designed to be used. And that tells me there's an improvement opportunity for me. Yes, yes. Yeah. I'm thinking you use the word behavior. And I think that's so critical that sharing that innovate, sharing that particular experience with everyone back at headquarters, mm-hmm. that it's going to it really that, that just shows the power of the story itself, that the power that the story can have on the behavior of mm-hmm. the company. So hearing that, hearing it come from leadership, the story really communicates that he was being observant. He was asking mm-hmm. uh, questions and and um, and trying to, like you said, get at the heart of why the customer was was using it in that particular way. Right. And yeah, so I think the the incremental innovation then to sort of show that this is how we value incremental innovation. Here are the behaviors that are valued at the company um, to support that. Storytelling can be an effective way of of trying to elicit that and spread it across the company. Right. Yeah. So, I, and I can think of a couple of more uh, if you're. I love it. Yeah. Keep them coming. Time. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So one of the other, I think, uh, uses uh, of story is to to communicate the idea that. Innovation requires p- play, for lack of a better word. Sometimes to be creative, you have to have some freedom to explore and and, and try things that you don't know if they're going to work. And and oftentimes we're taught in the business world to like micromanage things and you you can end up just micromanaging all of the creativity out of somebody because you've, you've limited them so much. And uh, one of my favorite stories to help communicate that message is about a young, a young boy so nine-year-old boy named James. So nine-year-old James is in the kitchen with his mom and his mom's sister. So while mom and auntie are sitting at the kitchen table having a cup of tea, James is standing at the stove watching the tea kettle boil. You, you may, uh, look on your face tells me you may recognize this from, from the book. So uh, yeah, don't spoil the ending. Um, <laughs> so uh, mom and auntie are having a cup of tea and uh, James is standing at the stove watching the tea kettle boil. And he's just fascinated with it. Right? He's watching the jet of steam come out the top of the tea kettle and uh, he's got a spoon and he holds it up there into the jet of steam and, you know, watches as the steam condenses into little drops of water and they trickle down the spoon, they drip into a cup that he's got set there, you know, and he's just watching the cycle go over and over and over again, just fascinated with it. Well, eventually his mother just gets, you know, tired of him, (laughs) wasting his time. She just barks at him. She's like, James, go do your homework, read a book, go ride your bike, right? Go do something, right? Aren't you ashamed of yourself just wasting your time like this? Well, Fortunately, young James was undaunted by his mother's admonition because 20 (laughs) years later, at the age of 29, and in the year 1765, James Watt reinvented the steam engine, ushering in the Industrial Revolution that we, of course, all benefit from today, and all based on that fascination with steam that he developed at the age of nine in his mother's kitchen. Now, uh, obviously, uh, you know, she didn't know that he was going to grow up to invent the steam engine, but the, the point is is that sometimes you need to play with things that you have no idea what fruit it's going to bear in order to be your most creative. And so leaders, people who manage people who are creatives and innovators, need to be super careful not to restrict them to, you know, you have to work on this project and this project and don't give them any time to just play with ideas because that's where a lot of the great innovation comes from is playing with ideas. I love that story so much. Uh, I think every innovator 
at, at the heart of an innovator is childlike curiosity and creativity mm. and being willing to bend the rules. And that story brings that to life so well. You know, there's an example. Um, if you head over to the Nike Innovation page, this is their mm. recruitment page for potential innovators to join their teams. There is a really cool video that they've produced. And um, it's really it really just sets a cultural tone for if you're interested in working with Nike, working at Nike and being creative, here are the rules we play by. We don't play by rules, right? And that's kind of part of their overall brand mission anyway. But mm -hmm. uh, the imagery from the video is sort of like uh, hands caked in flour and eggs breaking and mm -hmm. uh, sewing machines getting destroyed. <laughs> and it's, it's really like sort of a hodgepodge of images that hearken to this idea of being playful and not having a lot of boundaries and rules around uh, how you can create a different uh, experience for athletes. Mm. Um, I like I, it. Yeah, there's more. I think there's. it's neat to see companies owning, really at, a, at an organizational level, owning their identity as innovators. Have you, uh, do you have stories um, that sort of speak to how that sort of culture of play gets permeated through story? Something closely related. Um, so there's a guy named Chris Ostoich who uh, had founded a company, and like an HR management company that I think is probably not in business anymore, but um, uh, what he did there was close to that. So um, he, so most companies have a policy against moonlighting, right? Like you, basically, right. if you're going to work here, you're going to work here. Like, you, yeah, don't work anywhere else. So he had a policy at this company that about moonlighting also, but the policy was everybody's required huh. to do it. Nice. Right? Everybody, the company, if you want to work here. So in, in specifically in order to get hired, you had to show that you had some interest in something outside their, the industry they worked in and that you were passionately committed to. And once you joined the company, you had to make sure you worked at least 25% of your time at either a volunteer job or one, even one that got paid outside of their company. And if you ever dropped below like 25% of your time working there, he'd fire you, hmm. right? It just sounds bizarre, but right. here's, here's why. See, he, so, uh, so he, it was a startup company that he, he started. And at the same time, he was on the board of directors of the local fine arts fund. Okay. Um, and so he would go to the board of directors meetings once a quarter or whatever. And every time he did, he, he would bring his notebook and he'd have his notebook out on the table in front of him. And on the left-hand side of the page, he would be taking notes for the board meeting that he was having and, you know, things he had to go do and whatever. But on the right-hand side of the page, he was writing down ideas for his company because, you know, a small fine arts fund fundraising board is kind of similar to managing a startup. It's they're both small organizations with few people, and some of them aren't getting paid a whole lot yet. And you know, anyway, there's enough similarities that the things, the problems, and the challenges that the Fine Arts Fund was having were similar enough to the challenges he was having running a fledgling organization. That when they solved a problem at the Fine Arts Fund, he would realize, oh, that could solve a problem that I that I'm having in my company. And he realized, gosh, that that this having this outside interest, having being on this board of directors at this other company is not not only is it not taking time away from my work that's becoming a burden, it's doing the opposite. It's actually helping me be better at my job. Um, and so he required everybody to have something that they're passionate outside. Uh, and he, he just he found that it worked. When, you know, one of his guys, um, uh, ended up working, uh, volunteering for a, uh, a, 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 a political, not a person, political campaign, but a, a, an idea, a law that they wanted to pass locally. And he was raising money for it and getting people to, um, you know, volunteer for it. And what he ended up realizing was that many of those people ended up becoming their customers <laughs> just, <laughs> just because they knew him. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, even mm -hmm. it, it could be that simple that you're just meeting people outside that may end up becoming customers of yours. And so every time, every person he tr had tried that, it ended up paying dividends. And so, um, so it, it's similar to what you're suggesting. He's he's not creating a playful environment inside his mm. company. He's forcing them to go outside to do something they passionately enjoy or are committed to to create the same benefit. Definitely, it's incredible. It's uh, yeah, it, it's outside in thinking, mm -hmm. and uh, 
I think there's a vulnerability to that, and it it breaks a sort of traditional culture of what business is supposed to do. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that you're supposed to be loyal and, and, and steadfast, and um, and and really the idea of getting out of the office and uh, and immersing in other disciplines, other ways of thinking, but mm-hmm. but always being mindful of how it applies back to your work by doing that. At a company level, he was not only just asking people to do it, he was making it visible, too. Right. So now it's not just something that uh, people might do, but they don't talk about. Yeah. Now they're <laughs> they, telling stories about it, yeah. right? Because they, they know it. they have yeah. to. <laughs> and they're encouraged to, to share what they learned. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I, yeah. There, now that you mentioned the Nike, it's occurring to me that there are several companies in Silicon Valley that do something similar to that. I don't know, Google, Facebook, um, uh, Intuit. I know all of them have played with this idea of not requiring people to go outside, but giving them like 10 or 15, sometimes 20% of their time inside the company to do whatever they want. So, mm-hmm. you know, 80, 90% of their time is filled up with projects they're assigned to, but the remaining time is like, you work on whatever you want to work on and nobody's going to ask questions. Like yeah. that, that that never happened anywhere I worked, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the boss wanted to know what you were working on all the time. So it's a similar idea, getting people to have some flexibility to play with interesting ideas. As more individual professionals move into the world of consulting or want to become entrepreneurs, um, or even if they stay in large companies, there's that, that, that expectation that you bring your soul with you to work that, right. uh, it seems even more critical now uh, than it has been in the past where where people stayed mm. in, in one company for long periods of time. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So if, you, if you're not happy, you're going to leave. So companies have to keep you happy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do, do you have time for one more? Yes, please, please. Yeah. So I, I was thinking um, about Saatchi and, Saatchi and Saatchi. So the big advertising giant, right? Um, so one of their divisions, Saatchi and Saatchi X, which is a, a retail um, marketing firm centered down in uh, uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas. Uh, it was founded by a guy named Andy Murray. And uh, when he founded the company, and again, you know, going through those growing pains of a, a fledgling company, um, he was always looking for ways for them to do their job more e- efficiently because he had a lot of business, um, not a lot of people to, to get it done. And it just took a long time for the project to move from the initial meeting with the client and to the the research team and then to the design team and then to the production team and then getting it actually the marketing materials in store and all that. And um, so he's constantly looking for ways to do that more efficiently. And he noticed that his, his son's pediatrician um, was the best, A, the best pediatrician in town as rated by, you know, whoever people in town, but he also saw more patients than anybody else. He saw something on the order of 70 patients a day, hmm. right? And mo- apparently most pediatricians in the area saw like half that many a day. And that still sounds like a full day to me. Sure. Um, but he saw twice as many and he had the highest uh, ratings of, uh, what is it? Not bedside manner, but whatever, um, you know, patient. Patient experience, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He, so they thought he was the best doctor and he was the nicest doctor and he was the busiest doctor. And th- those things just don't add up, right? Right, right, Usually right. The, the, the busiest doctor is the one that's kind of the jerk to you. They're like, <laughs> get in, get out. You know, I took your temperature, now leave, you know, whatever. They, he got uh, 69 other patients to see. Yep. So he got fascinated with him and, he, and he, he asked the guy to come and visit him at his office and explain his process, how. How he how how can you do that when none of the other doctors in town can do it? And it turned out it wasn't so much in the way in the doctoring, it was in the nursing. So the way his nurses managed him was that they had a folder that went with each uh, patient, and it had all their their paperwork or whatever when they checked in. And then he walked in there and he did his uh, analysis of the patient, and inside the folder was a dictaphone. And he was supposed to pull out the dictaphone. He would, he would, you know, evaluate the patient and he would turn on the dictaphone and he would talk, I guess, to the dictaphone, but the patient's right in front of him. So he's kind of talking to both of them and he's telling them and the dictaphone the results of his examination, uh, what his conclusion is and what he recommends. You need to take this medicine. You need to, you know, take whatever, whatever their, their uh, prescription is. Uh, and then he put the dictaphone back in the envelope and just hang it on the inside of the door where it was when he got there. And then he would leave. Um, the nurse would then come in, get the dictaphone, go back and transcribe it, uh, f- get the prescription ordered from the pharmacy. Um, and like everything got done uh, uh, 
by them in the back room, whereas normally the way a doctor, all his competitors, what they would do is they would come in, they would evaluate the patient, you know, they would take some notes and then at, then they'd just hang on to those notes until the end of the day. And then mm. they'd go back through all their notes. Okay, for patient number one, we need to do this. And then they would call in the prescription or they would do whatever they needed to do. But by then, you know, they've kind of forgotten some of it and, you know, think ideas aren't as fresh. And the patient, the patients never see any of this normally, right? They don't know what the doctor does after they walk out of the room. But he did all that stuff right in front of the patient, which because of the dictaphone and the nurses doing what they're doing, made it more efficient so he could see more patients. But importantly, all the time that he was spending analyzing and making decisions and 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 dictating what to do was done in front of the patient instead of in a back room. So the patient could hear everything, all of his conclusions, and they felt like they had, you know, they had better rapport with the doctor. They felt like they understood their condition better. They understood the prognosis. They understood what they were supposed to go do because they weren't just reading it on some scribbled little piece of paper and nobody can read doctor's handwritings anyway, right? right. So it, it made a, not only a better customer experience, but a more efficient one. So now he started doing his business that way. They had a folder for every client and it would go from, you know, the, the, the intake department to the research department, to the design department, to the production department, to the, you know, shipping department. And everybody knew what happened in the one before. And so just the, the point is he learned about how to run his business more efficiently from a completely different industry who'd figured out that, how to do it more efficiently. So our, our natural instinct is to try and be as efficient as the most efficient competitor in our <laughs> industry. And what he learned was that, well, that wasn't good enough. He was already yeah. the most efficient competitor in his industry, but he learned something from outside the industry by looking at somebody else. So I don't know if you wanted to evaluate speed like that, evaluate how a NASCAR driver, what they do in the pit, right? right you know, right. don't evaluate other people in the, you know, delivery business like you're in. Look outside the industry. Yeah, and that's how disruption can happen. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Incredible. You know, I want to end. I, thank you, by the way. Every story you shared I, holds value, and it reminds us to be curious, to be interdisciplinary, mm. to look outside of our own verticals. And and I think all of that also fosters collaboration. And, and those yes. are all all attributes of a, of a strong innovator. I want to conclude. Amen to that. <laughs> I want to conclude by asking you, of all the innovation stories that are out there, uh, what sort of pattern is your favorite? You know, there's the garage guru, the person who's mm -hmm. the solo genius in the garage, sort of uh, coming up with something that's going to disrupt the entire world. There's the perspiring innovator, the one who just tries again and again and again. It goes back to the lab bench every day uh, until they discover the right uh, ch uh, solution to the mm -hmm. challenge. Or or there's the sort of surprise discovery, which uh, from a personal standpoint, yeah. uh, do you have a personal favorite when it comes to uh, the kinds of innovation stories that, that get your heart racing? Yeah, so that's a good question. I think it's not the first two for sure. And, and the reason is because I don't think that's replicable if that's a word, right? Like you, I, I can't just, you can't just tell somebody, Hey, you need to be a lone genius. <laughs> yeah. you, know, you need to, you need to be a, 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 a Bill Gates or what, you know, you just can't teach somebody to do that. So that those, so, um, you're right. It's kind so, of self-defeating. Yeah. You know, I'm thinking like, of what do we want to teach our children? Do we want to teach our children that, uh, if you're really, really lucky and you work right. all by yourself, that yeah. magic will happen. You can change the world. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. That's just not, yeah. So I don't like, so it's not those two for sure. Um, I think to me, and, and maybe this is the third one, or maybe it's something even different for, for me, it's one that teaches us um, more how to be more creative, even if we're not the natural born creators by and not just working harder. That's just so cliche. And I don't want to tell people, you know, you need to work your life away to, to fritters. I think it's being more observant because I think you can teach people to do that. So for example, um, the, the guy who, who figured out, uh, uh, electro, the whole electromagnetic spectrum back in the 1600s. Okay. Um, I think it's Hans Christian Orsted. So, uh, before that scientists had known that uh, about electricity and they had known about magnetism. 
But nobody had figured out there's this thing called electromagnetism that is responsible for the light waves that we see by and radio waves that we listen by and the you know, internet signals you and I are you know, uh, using right now, uh, microwave ovens. Like no, nobody had discovered that interaction between electricity and magnetism until this guy. And, but it turns out he wasn't the first person to notice the phenomenon. So li- literally the way it was discovered was um, he was doing a demonstration to a bunch of students. He was a professor, a physics professor in a in, in, uh, uh, Danish guy. And uh, he had this little electric circuit on the demonstration table, little wires and batteries hooked up to him and a voltometer showing, you know, and he was showing that. And there was a magnet sitting somewhere on the table and it was in the way. So he reached over and grabbed it and just shoved it out of the way. And when he did that, the little meter kind of fluctuated. And he thought, well, that's kind of weird. That, that has nothing to do with the electric current. And so he moved it back and moved it away again and it, it, it did it again. And he thought, well, that's weird. Well, anyway, he just put it aside and finished his demonstration. Later that day, he asked his assistant, hey, have you ever noticed that when you have a magnet somewhere near an electric circuit that it kind of makes the electric circuit go haywire? And the, the kid's response was, uh, yeah, yeah, it happens all the time. So we just make sure we keep the magnets in the, in the cabinet when we do those. <laughs> Yeah, sure. And it just didn't occur to him that that was interesting. And But that fascinated Hans Christian Orsted. And so he looked into it and, and he real, he realized that that was significant. And he discovered electromagnetism that way. So he wasn't the first person to notice it. He was the first person. So he wasn't just lucky, right? Or early or something. He was the first person to realize the significance of that weird thing that just happened. And that I think we can learn and and do ourselves if we're not just born this lone genius. Be observant and look for weird things that don't make sense. Be be curious. I think you can train yourself to be curious. You can just decide to be curious, but you can't just decide to be a genius. Or to be right? lucky. Or be lucky, right. Right? Right. right? But I think you can decide to be curious. And that, I think, is what leads to innovation that is replicable. I love that. Yes, that is such a powerful way to conclude our time together. I'm so grateful for this conversation. And uh, I hope that the entire innovation community is inspired by uh, some of these insights. So thank you so much for, for joining us today. Uh, it's been such an honor to talk with you. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me on. That was fun. Thanks, Paul. Bye. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on social media and add your voice to the conversation. You can find us at Untold Content. Untold Content.